It's Monday, March 27th, and this is Geek Nights. Tonight, we cop out and do a tech news roundup. Let's do this. Well, we're back after a long weekend of playing board games. Quite awesome new board games. Yep, we had some friends in from out of town. We went to play some uh, new games with the Moz types that we'll talk about uh, various Tuesdays to come. Yeah, we got some new games coming in the mail. We bought some new games. It's, yeah, it's on Impulse, I bought a giant, giant expensive board game that I played once. And I bought two normal size board games that I, one of them I played once and one of them I played nuns. <laughs> Zeros. All right, so I don't know who's out there. Uh, you might enjoy such wonderful cartoons such as Voltron, who is the best uh, ever. Yeah, Scott thinks this is news. It's all him. So a lot, for a long time, people have said, hey, every other freaking 80s cartoon is on DVD. Where the hell's Voltron? Where the hell's Voltron? Voltron's the best. Where's Voltron? I haven't been saying that, really. Not you, but everyone else who cares. Everyone else, eh? Yep. Well, All right. at Voltron.com, you, there was really nothing about Voltron. It was like this shit website that no one cared about. And uh, people said, hey, we want freaking DVDs, goddammit, and we want Voltron merchandise and toys and everything. Well, now Voltron.com is finally something cool. In two hours and two days and 14 hours as of right now, so I don't know when you're listening to this, but it could be uh, already happened or mere hours away. Voltron.com will relaunch with awesome, with supposedly awesome DVDs and forums and all kinds of great things, just like every other uh, wonderful website out there. We'll see if it uh, stands up to the test of time. The best thing about this is that there's a little flash thing on the site right now with the countdown, and there are like these great, great quotes on the uh, on the official site. Like, here, let me read one of them. It sucks that when you go to Voltron web- when you go to the Voltron website, you can't get any news about Voltron stuff. Almost every '80s cartoon co- has come out on DVD. Don't let the GoBots DVD come out before Voltron. <laughs> I'm getting really close to buying the crappy bootleg DVDs on eBay. I want Voltron so bad. That's serious stuff right there. And this is the people who own the rights to Voltron in America putting those quotes on their site, <laughs> being like, <laughs> "We're bringing it. You wanted it." Well, at least they know that there's a market. Yeah, and I think they're uh, hitting that market dead on. Are you going to buy it? Maybe. Maybe. There's a lot of Voltron, all right? I can't... It it's, could be too much money. <laughs> I might just... Again, the other thing is that a lot of Voltron episodes, especially later seasons, are really just, you know, uh, a row beast appears, Voltron, the guy's getting Voltron, they fight the row beast, they win, the episode's over. Repeat, repeat, repeat. But the first season has a little bit of plot and action going on, so I might buy, like, season one and then forget the rest. You should buy the last season. I don't think Voltron ended. Of course, I never seen all the episodes in order or anything. So I don't. I, I think it just it just kept fighting row beasts until it was canceled. Yeah, I don't know. I never really watched it when I was a kid. I, I was watched more into it, other shows. I watched it plenty, but I didn't. You know, I was a kid, and I watched it more recently, like in high school. But the only episodes I saw were all I've seen the first few episodes a whole bunch of times. But other than that, the only episodes I've ever seen are fight a row beast episodes over. So, all right. Yep. So now today is uh, Monday and SciTech Day, so we'll be getting to science and tech in the second half of the show as we usually do. A little bit of a cop-out in how we're going to do that, but we'll get to that when it comes. Now, I have some actual non-science, non-technical news to discuss. And it's something that Scott actually was unaware of until I told him about it, and it's not really being widely played out on the media yet. But to make a long story short, a law was passed by our government that was never voted on by the House of Representatives. The president signed it, and it's a law now. In other words, in a democracy, someone made a law without the people's permission, or without the people representing the people's permission. Now, this is kind of a complicated situation. I'm going to sum it up really, really briefly, and then you'll get some, uh, I guess, enlightened commentary from me, Scott and I. <laughs> I guess if, if you understand how the American government works, or the United States government works, it'll help a lot in your understanding. If you've ever seen Schoolhouse Rock, you'll know what I'm talking about. Yeah, but um, if you're from a foreign country, which I know some of you are, just ignore this shit. Yeah, you know we're screwed up over here. Yeah. But all right, so this law called the Deficit Reduction Omnibus Reconstruction Act of 2005. Great. This law was the one that cut all those social programs and cut, you know, student loans and whatever. 
And it was basically an effort by conservatives to say that they're actually trying to do something about the deficit and the debt and all that sort of thing. Well, we don't actually care about the content of the law. It's yeah, the that nature in which the law was except passed. Except for the fact that it was a highly partisan issue. Mm-hmm. As it, and also, it now originally it was written, right? And for all of you who don't know, the Senate and the House basically will write two separate laws that do the same thing. Except for those laws that have to originate in the House because they do, yeah. It's, oh, yeah, but yeah. then the Senate will write their own, basically. Yep, now, yep. what happens is that they'll write it, they'll both pass theirs. Then a committee will get together between the two, reconcile the differences, make a new law that they both then pass. That law is then the one that goes to the president. Mm-hmm. But the Constitution basically says that a law has to be passed by both houses of Congress. Mm-hmm. That is key. That is one of the fundamental tenets of American democracy. That's, that's like the first thing. How do you make a law? You write it, then one house votes, the other house votes, and if they both say yes, then it's a law. And that's the only way. There's no other way to make a law. Now, there was a conflict that happened like this around the turn of the century, and I don't know the details of that one really, other than that it was a similar situation, and the Supreme Court ruled that they had nothing to do with it, and they washed their hands of it, and Congress had to sort it out on its own, Mm -hmm. which doesn't bode well for us today. No, it doesn't. Now, basically what happened is the bill would barely pass, like barely. It was a tie in the Senate, which means that Shaney cast the the, uh, tiebreaker vote to make it pass. And in the House, it passed by, like, 11 votes, I think. Like, it barely squeaked by. Wow. That's close. So then, eventually, it gets in, and they start rewriting, you know, everything to try to reconcile the two versions. And they come to a final version, and to make a long story short, the version that the Senate passed in the end is different by the tune of $2 billion from the version that the House passed. And the committee that was supposed to reconcile all this, instead of, you know, doing the proper thing and having it voted on again in the House and rewriting it and fixing it, just gave it to the president to sign. And he signed it. And now it's law. And the House of Representatives has never actually voted on the actual law that got put in. So, wait, the law that was given to the president is exactly the same as the Senate one. It was not modified in any way whatsoever. No, no, no. The final Senate one. Oh, okay. The, the, the only difference is there's one clause that's different. They think it's due to a typo at some point in the process. Oh, that's fine. The thing is, the one that was passed is the typo version, not the original version. Oh, great. Because, so wait, there's a typo in the law. Can we use that? Um, Actually, there is a precedent. It's called the Enrolled Bill Rule, and the Supreme Court vetted this out back in, I think, 1892, sometime turn of the century. And basically, they say that even if there is outright fraud in terms of a clerk changing something or just outright, like, the person responsible just wrote the law differently and didn't tell anyone. It still stands if it's passed and signed by the president. The rule is... The one that the piece of paper that was signed by the president is the law. Well, the rule is if, a, if a, an enrolled law, a law that has been passed by the House and Senate, is given to the president and all the proper signatures are on it, those signatures constitute proof that it was voted on, not the actual record of Congress. Yep. The only actual proof is the signatures. But so the si- people who signed those documents chose to just sign something that wasn't voted on. Oh. Because they basically they didn't want this law to go back into the House because there's a really good chance it might not have passed this time at all. Well, doesn't it need the signatures of, like, you know, the House people? And yeah, the and they people? signed it. Oh, the thing well. is, the House didn't vote on it. Ah. Uh. Yeah, the leadership of the House decided to just, yeah, run with it. Well, I uh, got one thing to say. That's uh, against the Constitution. And I'm going to say the same thing I said earlier, which is that it's, you know, relatively easy to break a normal law. Like, oh, I killed someone. Or, well, I guess that's not so easy to do, depending on who you are. It's fairly easy. Yeah. I'd say. Oh, I, I robbed a convenience store. It's relatively difficult and rare to break, not just a law, but to break the Constitution. As in, you do something in a way contrary to the way the Constitution says you should do things. As in, be a congressman and make a law that limits free speech. That's not easy to do. I guess the easiest thing I could think of to do in the Constitution that would break it would be to be a policeman and search and seize without a warrant. Which actually happens all the time. It happens all the time, but that's not, you know, it's not the point. The point I'm making is that if you do something that's against the Constitution, I don't care if you do something that's against the law, that happens all the time. Smoking weed is against the law. If you do something that is against the Constitution, like you enslave someone, or you, I don't know, all kinds of, you uh, make a treaty with a foreign government, (laughs) 
<laughs> All right. Yeah. You should just lose your citizenship and get kicked out. You don't want... You obviously, you went against the fundamental <laughs> founding document of the entire country. You don't, obviously don't want to be here. See, I go just want away. to go back down more to the specific instance here because people, uh, some people have said that, oh, it was just a typo, don't worry about it, even though for some reason they passed the typo version. It's not about the not content. The I don't care about the content of the no, law. No, no, no. What I'm talking about is that, that everyone's saying, oh, it's just a typo. Whatever. Uh, it's not a big deal. It's only $2 billion, which isn't, which isn't much in the grand scheme. But I contend that this is just bad precedent for uh, future abuses, and this needs to be stopped now before someone uses this for something more uh, sinister. Yeah, hey, here's what I'm going to do. You ready? Everyone's going to vote on this law that says, uh, you know, we're going to cut taxes or something. And then I'm going to be the clerk who gives it to the president, and I'm just going to, you know, uh, change all the words before I give it to him. And it's going to say, give Scott all the money. Now, the precedent, the uh, enrolled bill rule, basically came out of the fact that it used to be very tedious to go through documents and make sure they were identical. Oh, very tedious. So they decided that it was better to let flawed documents get passed as laws than to prevent Congress from ever doing anything because they just, there weren't enough manpower available to actually vet everything. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, computers make that stupid. Computers do make it stupid, but I don't know about the computer and IT workings of the... Uh you know, legislative branch um, of our government. I will point out that the, to, I'm not going to get into this, but it's very archaic. Our legislative branches vote in the most archaic, obsolete, just ass That's what I was going to say, is that if they had some awesome computers, it would be all good. But no, they're using shit crap. They're not using anything. Shit crap. Uh, is that a technical term? It's what called what Windows. The, what the, no, they're not using Windows. <laughs> what are they using? They're using Commodores? systems that have been around for a long time. Yeah, maybe someone should rewrite that shit. What do you mean rewrite? They're not computers. Maybe they should get some computers. See, they don't. The, most of these people don't know anything about technology, hence all the uh, legislation that gets passed regarding it. Yeah, maybe there should be some sort of a uh, law about that. But anyway, regarding this actual, the thing that happened, despite the fact that the president and the leaders of the House and Senate say that, oh, it's no big deal, there are numerous lawsuits springing up everywhere regarding this. Hooray! And various civil organizations and law professors are all over it. So We will use terrible laws and bureaucracy to counter a broken law and bureaucracy. Well, actually, the people who brought this forward and brought it to light were basically washdog groups, which are private organizations that exist solely to keep an eye on the government. Because we need that, big time. Yeah. And that's not sarcastic. Want to just move to, like, Scandinavia? I don't know. I don't speak their language so well. I'm sure we could learn it. Like Swedish, I don't speak the Swedish. I know. Dutch, don't don't speak that either. We know a little bit of German. Uh, I think we could pick up other similar languages fairly quickly. I mean, Dutch is the closest to English, but <laughs> it doesn't sound the same. So, for things of the day... You all know that I at least currently work for IBM, and yeah. I'll tell you this, that there are bas two basic uh, help desk numbers that we call internally to IBM. There is uh, 1-888-IBM-HELP, which is for normal tech supporty crap, and 1-800-IBM-SERVE, uh, which is like, I'm a real IBMer, I need a new uh, DASD unit for this uh, server, whatever. So these are things that... IBM employees call, not well, things that IBM customers call? Well, uh, I was about to say that actually one of them, the normal tech support crap one, anyone can call. Uh -huh. And in fact, anyone can call the other one too. I just, I work for IBM, so we call them internally. Uh -huh. But anyway, the thing is, it's 1-888-IBM-HELP. It used to be, as in, while I worked here not too long ago, 1-800-IBM-HELP. Did they not pay the 800 phone number bill or something? No, nothing like that. Right. Just let me finish my story. Right. I don't know why you keep interrupting. You don't know anything about this. Right. So uh, a while ago, I mean, I used to call 1-800-IBM-HELP to get various things. And not too long ago, someone in our department called 1-800-IBM-HELP, not knowing that it had been changed to 1-888-IBM-HELP. And we discovered that 1-800-IBM-HELP is now a phone sex line. Awesome. So when they changed the number and got rid of the old one, someone must have just bought it either on purpose or it was just reallocated and they got it because I know 800 numbers are kind of scarce. And yeah, it's still published on a great number of internal documents as a phone number to call for help, which uh, is, lead, is leading to great amounts of hilarity. Double awesome. 
Uh, Dig has a story on it, which is what I linked to, but nine people have dug it because no one seems to care about this, but I found it funny. Yeah, I called it. It was pretty, it was like one of the best phone sex lines I've ever called. <laughs> I mean, you gotta um, understand. Uh, <laughs> what was that? I'll tell you a story. One of the best phone sex lines you've ever called? Let me tell you a story about this. Okay. We were at, um, Dorney Park, uh, in Wildwater Kingdom uh-huh. in Pennsylvania. Well, we weren't actually getting in. We were waiting outside because it was rained. It was raining, and they wouldn't let us into the park until it stopped raining. What? That's weird. But anyway. Yeah, it was pretty weird. Anyway, we're a bunch of, uh, like, seventh grade punk kids hanging outside of an amusement park. All right. Wanting to go inside, and the only thing there is out there besides us and the counselors is a payphone. So we start calling, like, 1-800-HOT-TITS, 1-800-GAY-GUYS, 1-800-GAY-GUYS. 1-800- Fat girls, 1-800, all kinds of weird shit. Great. Because we've got nothing better to do. And it's really weird that there's all these phone sex lines. None of those numbers will actually get you to actual phone sex. All you do is you call them and you hear a recording of an advertisement for another phone sex number. They're like, call this other number now to get the real phone sex and pay us money. Yeah. Well, wait, so what? Did you expect free phone sex? We were little kids. What do you want? <laughs> I've never actually called a phone sex line, so... Uh, I've never called one that, you know, I've only called to hear the little advertisements when it's funny. Uh-huh. Yeah. All right, all right. I believe <laughs> you. See, then we, this one I called, and it was, like, so <laughs> much more crazy than any of the other ones I've ever called. It's hilarious. If you want some fun, next time someone has trouble and it happens to be an IBM computer, just tell them to call 1-800-IBM-HELP. Yep. All right, so check this out. This is an awesome website I found today. I didn't quite understand it at first, but now I get it completely. It's the movie timeline. What this does is it puts the entire history of the entire universe in one giant text timeline. However, this takes into account a few assumptions. Number one, uh, the real world history is not the history we're talking about. The history we're talking about is... The history that would be true if every movie was the actual truth. All right, what about all the movies where the world gets destroyed? All of those are in here, too. Okay. So, it's pretty funny. It starts out with, in the beginning, is the first date. And then it says, God created heavens and the earth, the Bible. All right, whatever. Then it says, the next one is, a long time ago. Luke Skywalker and Han Solo lead a rebellion against the evil empire. Uh Uh-huh. Then, 26, that's got to be billion trillion bc los angeles and everywhere else the earth crust begin to harden adaptation i don't even know what that movie is but anyway it's a bunch of boring stuff for a little bit until you get to when the predators come 2897 bc october 10th bovey island antarctica predators arrive for their feasting ritual on xenomorphs and humans 2897, no, 2797 BC. It happens again. 2697, 2590, 24, and every hundred years, just a million predators arrive for their feasting ritual on xenomorphs and humans. Great. And of course, eventually, um, as more and more things happen in between uh, centuries, the predator feasting is separated by actual other events. Like, King Henry II plans a reunion to name his successor in The Lion in Winter. I've never seen that movie. You've never seen The Lion in Winter? Never heard of it. Wow, do you know about that? what happened, that story? I mean, it really happened. Well, I know about, uh, was it King Henry II? But I don't know about, you know, the movie. Really? What about King Henry II? What did he do? He planned a reunion. Yeah, yeah, we just won't get into that. Yeah. Now, I saw something similar a long time ago where people were talking about uh, television continuity mm-hmm. in the sense that what if basically they go from one show and any time there's a cameo between two shows, then obviously those shows are in the same universe and everything that's canon in one has to be canon in the other. Uh. And if you do that, it turns out that 99% of all television that has been shown in the last 40 years actually was an autistic kid's dream because there's one show that the final episode, you find out that the whole show is just an autistic kid's dream. And it was known as one of the biggest cop-outs in the history of television. Wow. Now, if anyone out there knows what the name of the show is, because I do, uh, post it in the forums, and the first one to do it wins the as-yet-to-be-determined prizes that we've been saying we might give out someday. That nobody has deserved or won yet. 
No, no, Alex got uh, the Duchy of Grand Fenwick. Oh, okay, so he, it's all, yeah. you know, it was all your prize. You give it to him. Yeah, I'll give him something. But if anyone knows the show that caused all TV to just be some autistic kid's dream, it ended with a snow globe. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. So one more thing to note about this movie timeline is it seems to bunch up around major events in history. Uh, the funniest of which I think is the Titanic, because there's like a bunch of entries for April such and such in 19, what was it? 1913, I think. I know two movies where the Titanic was saved. Yeah. So, <laughs> the funniest one is your April 15th, time-traveling dwarves appear on Titanic briefly. <laughs> <laughs> all right. All right, so it's Monday, and basically all the topics we'd thought about doing would either take research or time or some sort of preparation, which we weren't quite prepared to do. Yeah, now, if you know me, or you might not know me, I'm a computer programmer. Kind of. And there, according to uh, Larry Wall, the creator of Pearl, in the first Camel book, there were three great virtues of a programmer, which he listed. Those being laziness, impatience, and hubris. Yeah, that pretty much describes Scott. Yep. So, um, we're going to go with the first one here. We look at laziness, and today we don't really have a real topic. Basically, whenever we say it's a tech news roundup, that means we were too lazy to come up with anything real, so we sat and went through Slashdot, Fark, Dig, and Google News until we found enough things to talk about. So, um, the other thing is that we have a lot of ideas for what to do on Monday, but a lot of them require going against laziness, impatience, and hubris. Either that or the Specifically that, laziness. Either that or the things that we think might be interesting to some of you, but we're not sure how many of you would really want to listen to us talk for an hour about how cell phones work. Yeah. So. We need you, peoples, who are listening to this show, to go to our forums and also email us, geeknights at frontrowcrew.com. Ooh, <laughs> geeknights at frontrowcrew.com. Geeknights at gmail.com also works. Who cares? And tell us what topics you want us to talk about for science and tech on Mondays. Yeah, we'll do it, but we need some guidance here. Otherwise, you're going to get an hour of us talking about how cell phones work. Yeah, and because I predict a very low turnout of uh, people actually sending in requests of what we should talk about, if you send one in, you're pretty much guaranteed to get that show. So this is like uh, total request geek nights here. Yeah. I mean, basically, we know exactly how many people download a given episode. And we know how many people post in the forums. And one number is a lot bigger than the other number. Mm -hmm. So we know you're out there. We know you're listening. Yep. So anyway, Tech News Roundup. The last several weeks in tech, mostly the most recent week, because that's where all the news we remember happened. So I guess we can start off with, I know I mentioned that there was that uh, Internet Explorer bug. The third huge, horrible, unfixable IE bug that lets anyone root your computer with just you going to a website. So when did we talk about that? Last week? Yeah. Is it still unfixed? Not only is it still unfixed, and not only has it existed for a long time, but attacks are on the rise immensely. I, I, don't, I forget the number I saw, but the, the number of websites that are exploiting this is just exploding. If you use Internet Explorer on the internet at all, you're done at this point. The internet is just the Wild West. Can a, can a firewall save you? Nothing can save you. Nothing can save you. If you have a Windows computer, no matter what network or no Even matter what... Even if you're using the special private beta of Microsoft Windows Vista with Internet Explorer 7, the newest, newest rewritten version. It has the same bug. There isn't even an unofficial security patch from some hacker in uh, Norway or something? There are a bunch of obtuse workarounds, like turning off active scripting. But doesn't that make IE sort of yeah. unusable? Yeah. Get Firefox.com. Get Firefox.com. Luckily, on the feed side, I've seen a grand total of one person subscribe to our feed with IE. They still do. IE Some... can subscribe to feeds? Apparently. They, uh, must be IE 7. I don't think IE 6, 5 or 6 can do Or it's that. at least hitting the feed on a regular basis. They might not be subscribed. Yeah, they might actually be visiting feeds.feedburner.com. Yeah, whoever they... you are. I mean, last time we called someone out for uh, the PSP, they actually got back with us. So if you're using Internet Explorer to uh, hit our feed burner feed... Uh, we're not going to tell you to stop listening, but... Uh, we are going to put the exploit up there and get <laughs> No, you. we're not. Here we are. We're going to force you to we download... We can't, because I can't edit the HTML of the feed burner feed uh, easily. We'll, we'll get it on, on some other site. I don't you think we it. need to. Uh, whoever you are, uh, you might want to run some antivirus, because you're probably already rooted. You might want to reformat your hard drive and install Linux. That'll help. All, All right. right. 
So there's these guys. You know how if you get a credit card, so, like I have a Sony credit card to get these Sony points, which means I could get Sony stuff for cheap, like our television. Yeah, we got the cheapest television in the world because of that. It was like a hundred bucks for a 27 inch awesome flat glass, not flat screen TV. Anyway, um, and you can also get frequent flyer miles and who knows what. They're coming out with credit cards where the more real money you spend on the credit card, you get either World of Warcraft gold or Second Life Linden dollars. This is kind of really good for the credit card companies because basically they give you an incentive to spend more money, yet they give you immaterial nothings. It's genius. Uh, I say more power to them. This is fantastic. More power to the credit card companies. But at the same time, if I ever see someone with a World of Warcraft credit card or a Second Life credit card, it's an idiot tag. It's like, hey, they could be getting actual goods points if they used a different credit card. But no, they would rather have immaterial goods. Basically, it's the same tag as, uh, like, say people who drive an H2 Hummer. Yeah. I mean, it's something where there's really no excuse. I mean... These things that they give on credit cards, like the worst ones are the ones where they say, anyone who, every time you spend money on your credit card during these months, you're entered for a chance to win a giant prize. Those are the worst. But anyone who spends more money in order to get points or get stuff or enter contests is dumb. Unless you're working a scam. Unless you're working a scam. If you got a scam going, oh, oh, way to go. I mean, if you've ever seen uh, Punch Drunk Love, where the guy does the scam with the uh, freaking flyer miles, anything like that is awesome. I never seen that, but oh, okay. Any oh, it's scam, a good movie. I'm, I'm all for any scams. I'm a mad scammer. It's the only as movie long that's as ever not a Randy me a scam. As long as it's not a Randy scam. Yeah. Oh, we didn't talk about the reflexologist. We can do that some other time. We'll talk about those Thursday. All right. So, um, yeah. All right. So uh, remember a while ago we talked about that new law in Japan? Not a new law, but a law that finally came into effect that basically banned all old technology. And Rim said he didn't believe it, but no, he was wrong. There really was a law. Oh, no, no there really was a law, but the law didn't do nearly what Scott said it did. Well, no, it was going to originally. Then people protested. So what happened is they did a slight amendment to the law. They're like, okay, now some stuff is okay, but some stuff still wasn't okay. So what happened is literally... People took to the streets with their old technology, and now the law has been changed once again. So now you can, it's not completely erased, like the law is still there, but there's a loophole like 10 miles wide in diameter that yeah. says you can rent old technologies. So if you go to Japan and try to buy some old Famicom, the guy might make you sign a paper about renting it, but you can just ignore that. It's totally yours. Yeah. Now, I mean, even before, the law wasn't really that bad. All it stated was basically that things that weren't certified under the new uh, electrical safety guidelines had to be recertified to be resold Yeah, but in, it also, in, in, in retail space. Yeah, it, also, it didn't really affect private consumers that much. Well, it did. It made a lot of things that um, already existed, like, were never going to be certified again because they're unsafe, including, Here's like, the thing. old It's okay Casio to own keyboards. the uncertified Oh, thing. it was okay to own They just them, couldn't yes. be sold in retail spaces, basically. Yes, but, you know... And Japan- you could also get them underwritten privately, and then it'd be okay again, most likely. I didn't see that. Well, that wasn't in the law, but that's a legal thing that someone could probably have done. Maybe. Japan's laws are weird. Yeah, but the I was The point was is that there are many, many geeky stores in Akihabara and such... And Japan is often the only place to get many old, awesome electronics. And all of those that are... There's stores that exist solely to sell these things. And they were basically going to be totally reamed. But now they're okay. Because now they're rental shops. In quotes. And it's all good. I just think it's cool that the people of Japan took to the streets. Like, literally. Yeah, people in this country don't take to the streets when their constitution gets broken. There's a picture of a People in Japan take to the streets when a Casio keyboard becomes illegal. There's a picture of a dude dancing around with his Casio keyboard. I think he's a musician. In the street with Scasio keyboard. <laughs> it's awesome. So uh, I, remember, I know a while ago we were talking about campaign finance law and how there was a move to basically censor the internet and force bloggers to count anything they say politically as though it were campaign contributions and various things like that. It was decided today that, no, that's BS. You can say whatever you want on the internet as long as you're not paid directly to do so. Hooray! I believe I don't remember the exact quote, but they basically said that you can't hold certain members of the media accountable to one standard and other members to another standard. Members of the media are on equal ground. Yep. 
That so a win for bloggers, a lose for the mainstream media, and it's also a win for graft and corruption, but whatever. Yeah, that's the one thing I was going to say. Now any old candidate can start up some blogs, make up fake people to run those blogs, or hire some people to run those blogs. No, you can't be paid. Ah, but what if they don't know? Now it includes a whole bunch of other things. One really big one is that you cannot be denied the right to use your computer from a corporation or an educational facility or anything like that for political things, as long as you do so on your own time. And so, you're not specifically So you can post your political blog during lunch, but not during the morning. Basically. Yeah. And a whole bunch of other fine. stuff. The Whatever. Only re- now, in regards to the graft and corruption and everything, I'm not worried, because if you list all the rights in order, I think freedom of speech trumps the danger of graft. Oh, yeah. I'm not saying that uh, I disagree. This is great compared to what the, uh, the previous alternative was. You know, that was terrible. That would have been like the worst thing ever. <laughs> But no, I still, I wish there was some way we could make a law that to get rid of the graft and corruption without limiting the freedom of speech. There's really no way, not the way our country's set up. Or at least stop it a little bit. You don't have to completely eliminate it. You know, just get rid of that evil corruption. There should be like the Anti-Corruption Act of such and such. Yeah, year. you know how many laws are called the Anti-Corruption Whatever Whatever that don't do anything? Or that make more corruption or open up loopholes for extra corruption? Yeah. yeah. There's really no way. There would be a way. Oh, yeah, if, if people, people were weren't civic-minded. Corrupt. No, if people were civic-minded and voted out corrupt people. Yeah, that too, but it's hard to tell who's corrupt sometimes, because that's part no, of being corrupt. No, it's real easy right now. Almost everyone. <laughs> yeah, sad, sad. I mean, the only person who might not be corrupt is possibly Elliot Spitzer. Yep, uh, and who knows? It's like a 50-50 shot. Yeah, think about it. To us, he's probably the most trustworthy person in the government of the United States right now. And all he is is the attorney general of one state. And even then, we only trust him halfway. Yeah, and he might be a governor. That, that, that'll be something. Yeah, we'll see. Yeah. Obama's a little bit corrupt, but not much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I guess he's number two. Everyone else is terrible. All right, let's uh, beat our favorite dead horse. Yeah, Sony. Whee! So, Sony item number one, the PS1 factory is closed. Now, I have mixed feelings on this. One, that's fine. They probably wasn't making money anymore. And whatever, they can do whatever they want. There's plenty of PS1s in the world. Yeah, you can also perfectly emulate the PS1 on pretty mediocre hardware these days. Or on a PS2. Yeah, the games are a dollar each. Four dollars. Four dollars. I've seen some for a dollar. Those are the games you don't want to play. Now, the one thing is that the PS1 is actually really popular in South America. Oh, getting South America is like the land of PlayStation 1s and Genesis's. Yep. And now, the reason I'm not worried about that is, quite simply, I'll bet someone's just going to start a factory in South America and start making PS1s. Oh, no, but you know what you'll see? You know how there's all these, uh, like, the NESX? and yep, all like, yep. it's an, And it's a Nintendo console, it's an NES, but it's made with newer chips and fewer of them for cheap. Yep. You're going to see a lot of, like, you know, some guy makes something that is basically a PS1 for, like, 30 bucks. And there's a bunch of bootleg. It'll say, like, you know, May Station on it or Play Sa- play Sensation or who knows. And now, it- this isn't a big deal because the PlayStation 2 was pretty much 99% compatible with the PlayStation 1. Yeah. So, I mean, people have a PS2. Unlike the Xbox 360. Yeah, or unlike possibly the PS3. Yeah. Sony won't commit to saying that it's actually going to be backwards compatible. Well, ha- let's talk about the PS3. They're having a few problems with it, apparently. All right, uh, one, Blu-ray is still uh, expensive and difficult to make. Well, so is HD DVD, so who cares? Yeah, but know? the thing is, HD DVD wasn't a prerequisite for the Xbox. No, it wasn't. Blu-ray is most definitely a I prerequisite. Think, I think Microsoft was thinking about it, and then they just decided that they would go for the quick release instead. Yep, and they gave Sony some rope, and Sony must have thought they could pull something off here, but <laughs> they haven't. Yep. Well, the thing was, that the Game Developers Conference, which just happened... Uh, they wanted Sony to plug in the PS3 via an HDMI cable to get some HD going on, and Sony wouldn't do it. They kept it on a little analog cable. I wonder why. Maybe the PS3 not not doing so well. Don't the technology not not quite there yet? Yeah, I wish I could say because I mean I work at the freaking IBM factory where we make the chips that go into it and all that stuff, and I know a lot more about this than I can say. But I think I can say perfectly legally that Sony is having issues, and the issues are caused entirely by Sony. <laughs> no one knows. No one cares. But well, well, a lot of people care. A lot of people really 
are waiting for the PS3 to come out, and that's why they might be holding off on the Xbox. Yeah. A lot of people see Sony as winning this round. See, I don't know. The only people I think who see that, it seems to be like these army of Japanese RPG addicts. Those are the only people who go for the PlayStation. Honestly, a lot of gamers, but not gamers like us, but like the new generation of gamers who don't read the news and they don't really know what's going on. All they know is that a PlayStation 3 is coming out. They don't actually know about it or what's going on. So I don't think they realize all the trouble Sony actually has having. I don't think they actually, like, you know, it's only, like, real crazy gamer types that know, like, more details than just the word PlayStation, you yeah. know? It's like, there's people who just want to play, like, the new Madden and the new GTA, and they have two choices of system to play it on, and, you know, they go by name recognition is really the only difference. So like, oh, I'm playing it on my P. you know, that's that's why they're arguing of when... You see all these discussions of like, oh, the Xbox 360 is going to be more powerful than the PS3 because there's people who are going to play the same games that are available for both systems and they're not playing any exclusive games. They're not going to play Japanese RPGs and they're not going to play Halos. They're just going to play Madden and EA games. So they have to pick a system based on which one has the best graphics. Now, let's talk about the technology here behind the Sony PlayStation 3 because, one, they've missed all their dates. I mean, originally, wasn't it they are going to have a release in, like, November? Well, they said spring of this year. And then they find... Everyone's like, you're not going to make it the spring of this year. Well, and it's finally spring. Finally, they said there was going to be a delay. Finally. Yeah. And it keeps getting pushed off. It looks like now the earliest it'll come out in Japan is near the end of this year. Like, November. Awesome. And as for the U.S. release, I don't think anyone believes they're going to be out before March or April of next year. Well, uh... That means the revolution's gonna beat him by quite a bit, possibly. The revolution, I guarantee, I'm a, I'm like 99% sure, will be here by the holiday season of this year. Now, it uses the PlayStation, the IBM cell chips, which, independently, are very powerful things. The difficulty is that it takes a lot of programming expertise and special compilers to write software that'll actually take advantage of it. So, oh. developing for the PlayStation 3 is not the straightforward process it was for the PlayStation 2 in that the same expertise is not useful. Well, actually, programming for the PlayStation 1 was, like, crap easy. It was literally, like, you code in C and you write some OpenGL. They even had a thing called the Yarozi, J-A-R-O-Z-E, that was, like, $750. It was a black PlayStation 1 that you could use to make PlayStation games. And I remember a lot of people bought them and did. there's still people out there who have them and do crazy stuff with them. You might even find one on eBay. Yeah. The PlayStation 2 basically was a lot of the same, but it just made everything more complicated and more difficult, but still manageable. And the PlayStation 3 seems to just be up oh, insane. No one's ever programmed like this before. Everyone has to learn it from scratch. It's just a huge pain in the ass. Yeah. I mean, the cell chips are not what a lot of people seem to say they are. and I don't think many people out there actually really understand what they do. Now, I'm not going to go into that. But if anyone, if you guys have feedback, if you really want to know, I can talk about quite a bit of exactly what the cell chip is and why it's powerful, and in my opinion, why Sony, I think, made a bad move. Yeah. Not in terms of using a technology, in terms of not giving the developers enough time to be able to use the technology. That's one thing. Nintendo is real smart. Um, with the revolution, what they're doing, obviously, is... It's mostly the same as coding for the GameCube. The only difference is now you have some new input devices you can handle from slightly more power to work, you know, more memory, more, you know, that kind of sort of stuff. Yeah. It's not, if you know how to make GameCube games, you can make freaking Revolution games. It's not that different. Except yeah. for, of course, there's a new library to handle the internet wireless business. And coding for the Xbox is code for a freaking PC. I know. The Xbox is basically, you write DirectX games. And the Xbox 360... You write DirectX games. It's no different. Now, if Sony... That's had, why you see all these PC If Sony games. had working hardware, if Sony had had their working hardware together and they were ready to go already, then it wouldn't be that far off for them to put all the dev kits out, put everything out, let the developers learn their new environment, and then go nuts. The problem is, Sony doesn't even really have their hardware in line yet, which means they can't really give the dev kits out and say that these are going to be the dev kit, or this is going to be the platform, which means the developers haven't been able to do any real work. We don't even know what the controller is going to be. I mean, they showed that horseshoe controller, and then I put that thing on my blog about how it's a ripoff and whatever, whatever. And now they're saying, oh, that's not the final end. They're not committing to anything. They're so non-committal that you might as well just say there might not even be a PlayStation 3. They haven't even committed to that yet. Or that might be the only thing they've committed to, is that there will be a PlayStation 3 on some date. 
Now, in terms of Blu-ray and HD DVD, I think Sony realizes that there's been a lot of flack about Blu-ray lately because they made that nice gesture of, hey, all right, we won't do that analog downsampling. Even though what they really meant was, all right, the first few DVDs we release ourselves won't make use of that feature that will, in fact, be in all the players anyway. Mm-hmm. And also the fact that I don't think consumers really give one shit one way or the other. I think HDTVD, HDTV, because their HDTVs are selling. When you look at TVs that are selling now, a lot of people are buying HDTVs as opposed to regular ones. Yeah, despite the fact that the standards change and a lot of people are getting screwed with obsolete HDTVs that can't watch modern encrypted things. But Yeah, the thing is, is that consumers don't actually understand. They can barely hook up like a VCR to a TV. They can't even get the 12 to stop blinking on their VCR. Yep. Now, HDTV, remember that statistic I pulled up months ago where they basically interviewed people and discovered that a good 75% of people who have who think they have HDTV actually don't because they don't have it hooked up right, and it's not really working. Yeah, like my dad, he had an a- he bought an HDTV. It's a Sony WEGA, and he had this non-digital cable, and there was no source of HD content going to the television at now, all. Now, the thing is, people think they see it because an HDTV independent of the digital, is a very high-quality television. Oh, yeah. Which means even if you put a crap signal in it, it'll look better than it looks on your crap TV. The thing is, it doesn't look that much better with the full HD than it would anyway. Very few things actually take advantage of HD. And in fact, some mediums, well, media, are actually hurt by it. For example, uh, daytime sitcom type things. HD, if you film those in HD, the uh, poor makeup becomes readily apparent and it actually looks worse. Yeah, if something wasn't designed to be HD and you upsample it or watch it on a TV that's better than it was supposed to, or you film something in HD that shouldn't be... Yeah, you can see the freaking actress's pores and it doesn't look good. Yeah. Actually, I think HDTV is useful. The m- number one thing that I think HDTV should be used for is sports. Yes. It's the best thing in the world is watching hockey and you can see more hockey. Two, movies that are designed for it. Yeah, there's a website that shows you Lord of the Rings, HDTV, and not HDTV. Basically, all the pictures are non-HDTV, and when you mouse over them, the HDTV image takes its place. There's a freaking striking difference. Like The thing damn. is, while the difference is striking in a still, because of the way TV works, these old TVs with the interlaced scanning, if you actually watch it moving, the difference is far less noticeable. The difference is far less. Another thing I noticed is that a lot of TVs you'll see in stores, the brightness is cranked all the way up because that's what sells TVs is bright colors and high, bright, bright colors and high contrast because that looks really cool. You see like, you know, bright blue sky, yellow flowers, green, green stems waving, you know. But really, if you want to, the, the real picture is supposed to be much, much darker. Like I know on our TV, there's like vivid, normal, pro and custom are like the four settings. If we had HD TV, Pro is what you want to set it at. Yep. But if you've just been looking at Vivid, Pro looks like it's dark or something, and you're like, I can't see. But that's how it's supposed to look. And if you actually set it on Pro and leave it there on an HD TV, and you darken the room when you watch, that's there it is. That's the real image. But I guess my my final take on HD TV is that it's nice. It's not worth the money. It's not worth the DRM. It's not worth the complication. It's not worth the fact that it goes obsolete constantly because they're so afraid of piracy that they're crippling their own formats. Mm-hmm. If it had just been HDTV, if the industry had just said, all right, here's the standard, uh, with the, over the next 10 years, we're going to have better television for everyone, yay. That would have been great. But no, everyone's fighting with each other. They're more afraid of their consumers than they are of each other even, so they're fighting against us. They really have no allies here. Except for crazy nuts who always buy TVs whenever a new thing comes out. Yeah, those guys who need that 100-inch TV. Yeah, the guys who basically spend their lives watching movies. I'm probably going to buy an HD TV probably maybe five, six years from now. Because when Nintendo comes out with their next console, they said, uh, I think Oriwata was talking about it, how the, reason they, the real reason they didn't do HD TV now is because, sure, it wouldn't hurt to throw it in. You know, it might increase the cost of the console, but... They're already so much cheaper than everyone else, it wouldn't matter so much, and whatever. 
There are a bunch of other reasons not to do it that are obvious, but the number one reason was that there's no standard for HDTV, and people wouldn't even really get it to work, and who knows it would work on every HDTV. And... Yeah, plus making games in HDTV is mostly silly, because all it does, for now at least, is add development time. Yep, it adds, you need more pa- processing power, it take, it's harder to develop, you need more graphics. Guys. And honestly, the differences, I mean, when the Xbox 360 came out and I played a bunch of the demo games, it didn't really look much better than previous similar games I saw on the Xbox normal. Yeah, and you know, sure, even a 1080p TV doesn't come close to a PC monitor. And you still don't have the interface to do the PC type of games. So, it just makes it look shiny, which doesn't affect the game at all. Yeah, and of course, we see the problems with overheating in the Xbox, and I'm sure the PlayStation 3 is going to have some similar problem. But a few years down the road, I'm sure there will be one HDTV standard, and you know, everything will start to work eventually. Hopefully. If it doesn't, then fuck them all. Yeah. And by then, Nintendo will say, okay, HDTV is this standard, and they'll make the next console after the revolution. We'll support that. And that's probably when I'll buy an HDTV, because there'll be a standard, and it'll make sense to buy one. And the price won't be stupid insane. Now, what else has Sony screwed up? They had the root kits, which they're still being sued over. They're not beating the iPod. Uh, Sony Online Entertainment with their Star Wars Galaxies is pretty much in the shitter. Yeah, and they're like, ever- it's done. World of Warcraft killed off all their MMOs. Their PlayStations are dead. Their electronics are getting kicked their ass by Apple. Their computer's not so good. Their memory yep. stick's getting beat by Sandisk. Their stock is dropping. And honestly, my, my here's my uh, prediction. Rim's uh, Randy Million Dollar Challenge psychic prediction for the future of Sony. I think that Sony Sony hardware is going to eventually somehow split itself off from Sony intellectual property. That's not the actual names of them, but I think there's going to be a schism between the two Sonys. Could because be. currently, I think most of Sony's problems come from the fact that half of Sony wants to make things to sell to people, like devices that do things people want. And that's a very lucrative market. The other half of Sony wants to sell ideas that are free anyway to people for a lot of money and doesn't want those devices to exist. So instead, Sony has to compromise and sells shit, adv- shit devices that barely work and don't do everything we want. I mean, Sony's, the real reason Sony didn't beat the iPod isn't because they didn't come out with a better, cheaper device soon enough. I mean, there were some pretty good Sony MP3 players. The problem was that originally they didn't support MP3 and they didn't plug into computers easily and they were, you had to use the stupid A-Track 3 thing and God. Yeah, and I mean, look at Minidisc. Minidisc was awesome and then they crippled it to all hell. Well, Minidisc was kind of big in Japan, actually. But yeah, not but in so the much U.S., here. not so much. Minidisc, if you don't know, is like a little tiny CD in a plastic case. that can It was re- magneto-optical, wasn't it? Yeah, you can actually record onto it, you know. But it, it worked like a tape in that you couldn't... Uh, I won't get into all the details. If, if you don't have one, you don't care. If you have one, you already know. Yeah. But just imagine, you know, it was supposed to be better than CD. It was supposed to be like, oh, it's CD quality, but you can record onto it like a tape. Ooh. Yeah, it was a tape CD. And it was small, and, and it was, it's actually kind of handy until MP3s came around and kicked its ass. Yeah, but they DRM crippled it to hell, and it ended up being almost useless. Yeah, I mean, if you could have let people uh, you know, buy mini discs in the store for a good price, then copy tracks off of them onto other mini discs and mix it up, then copy them onto computers and all, it would have been great. You couldn't even get consumer equipment that would record easily to mini disc, especially not from any sort of digital source. Yeah. And if you wanted that equipment, you had to buy the professional mini disc stuff that cost 10 times more. Of course, it wasn't really that different at all. It just had a digital input. Yeah, I mean, technologically, it was identical almost. It just had the word pro on it and a bunch of extra dollar signs. So, uh, yeah, we'll see if Sony ever actually gets his act together and splits off. But if it doesn't, uh, I don't think they're going to be a viable company in the next decade. Who knows? The only thing that really, I think, that keeps them from splitting isn't intelligence. It's Japanese pride. <laughs> you know a lot about Japanese pride. Super aguri. <laughs> super aguri. Yeah, super aguri. Yeah. Those guys, well, I, I'll admit at least, I mean, they're racing F1 cars. They're probably enjoying themselves. Yeah. Do you know what cars, you know where those cars came from? Where? They're four-year-old Arrows cars. Mm-hmm. In other words, that's like if you went to, um, let me try to think of a really good analogy. Well, anyway, for those who don't know, in Japan, they, they have, there's this one F1 team, Super Aguri, and they are basically, they only exist so that there will actually be Japanese people racing. Mm-hmm. Because 
they're the two worst drivers in Formula One. Well, no, Takuma Sato probably isn't the second worst driver in Formula One. Uh-huh. He's one of the. Who was five... the one that crashed in Bahrain? Crash in Bahrain. He, he hit the wall in the pit. Oh no! And he, then didn't he almost crash. Hit, he didn't. He, he didn't bumped hit. into it, and then he bumped into one of his dudes. No, he didn't hit the wall. He just hit one of his dudes. That's Yuji Ide. He's, <laughs> he he actually that guy comes from um, Japan Grand Prix, like uh, what's the JGTC and all those sorts of things. Ah. like they're j- special Japan only racing circuits and such. And that he's won a few things there, but F one is so far beyond any other race, even in the shitty four year old Aeros car, that he's got nothing. So those are all the major technologically inclined stories we have uh, various commentary about this week. And if you don't want to hear us do boring, just like every other tech podcast out there, you know, uh, send us ideas of what to talk about on Monday. Yeah. Anything you want us to talk about that has any s- slight connection to anything science or technology, we'll do it. Unless we know nothing about it whatsoever. Uh, we'll do it anyway. Yeah. Yeah, we'll do anything. We'll do the first one we get. Yeah, if you want to hear about, you know, uh, like a National Geographic documentary on giant squids, or I don't care. <laughs> I just think about squids. I think part of the problem is that we put science and tech on Monday, which is, it's not a difficult topic for us, but it's difficult to come up with a good idea to talk about that wouldn't just yeah. bore the hell out of I you. I know more about technology than I know about almost anything else, but most I could talk about just informative technology stuff for hours yeah. and hours and hours. I mean, I, hours. just today, as I was talking to Scott, I could drone on for a couple hours about nuclear weapons. Yeah, I could drone I mean, on. if you guys wanted something like that, we could do it, but... I could sit here for, like, three hours telling you how to configure a Linux kernel based on your hardware. Now, the other problem is that Mondays, you'd think, oh, it's the beginning of the week, we're fresh off the weekend. No, we're absolutely wrecked from the weekend, because we spend the weekend playing board games with friends, usually. Mmm, great. Yeah, board games, I consider them to be as exhausting as physical activity, only it's mental exhaustion. Mm. And as you can tell, we're rambling currently, so uh, that's the end of today's episode. Woohoo! Well, tonight's episode. Going to bed. Tomorrow is gaming day. Yeah. I forget what we're going to talk about. I can tell you, though, that you, even if you aren't an uh, unusual subscriber to the Tuesday feed, you will want to listen to tomorrow's episode, download it manually if you must, because I have some excellent things of the day. Oh, really? Yeah, really. Actually, uh, I have to agree with him on this. It's kind of relevant to technology because it harkens back to a technology platform that is so maligned that most people don't even know it ever existed. I knew it existed, and I remembered something that I no one else remembered about it. I played games on it. I did also. Anyway, yeah, we've talked about it at least once before in the show. We have. In fact, it was my thing of the day a while ago because I had some video from it. Awesome. And that was Geek Nights with Rim and Scott. Special thanks to DJ Pretzel for our opening theme. Be sure to visit our website at www.frontrowcrew.com. If you like our podcasts, you'll love our forums. Make sure you visit them. You can send your email feedback to geeknights at gmail.com. And if you want, you can leave us a voicemail at 206-333-1537. Geek Nights airs every weeknight, Monday through Thursday. Geek Nights is recorded with absolutely no studio and no audience. But unlike those other talk shows... It's actually recorded at night.